Now, Gauss's law articulates the symmetry between charge and electric field written in a manner that in general does not lead to good analytical expressions but for electric field, but in situations of high symmetry, it's effective. This abstract quantity, uh, the in integral form, this extract expression says that for a surface enclosing some charge, so I showed a charge Q enclosed by a surface which may or may not be spherical, the integral of the normal component all around the, the surface of the electric field is equal to, to the char enclosed charge divided by the dielectric constant or the permittivity, where the permittivity is uh, the, the relative permittivity times the, the perm epsilon not permittivity of free space. Uh, th this in itself is difficult to solve, but in cases of high symmetry, uh, this procedure can lead to expressions that um, are, are actually pretty straightforward to get. Uh, and, and the case I want to do for you is the case of an infinite a wall of charge. So I'm going to sketch out an infinite wall of charge and we use this artistic uh, expression here where the squiggly lines mean it goes on for infinity and I'm going to paint charge all over the surface and paint is the correct metaphor. If I asked you how much charge is on the wall you would say an infinite amount because it's an infinitely large wall. But a more reasonable question is what is the charge density? The coulombs per area will use square centimeters. Coulombs per square centimeters. Big Q will be the charge density. Now I'm going to uh, draw an imaginary cylinder that is perpendicular to the wall and passes through it. So perpendicular and penetrates. It's uh, very it's long, but the length of the cylinder doesn't even matter. And the, well, the reason why has to do with what the electric field is doing. Uh, there are some, a few things I know about the electric field of a wall of charge that's going to help me to write down that integral on the left-hand side of Gauss's law. If I have an infinite wall of charge, I, can, I, I know that the electric field is perpendicular everywhere to it because if, if, I, had, if I consider uh, electric field lines not perpendicular to it, the components that aren't perpendicular would cancel, leaving only what's perpendicular. So I'm going to sketch in the electric field and I have it coming out both sides because electric field lines emanate from positive charges and terminate on negative charges. And it's going to uh, penetrate the flat end walls of the cylinder, which have an area A. And while I'm at it, I may as well talk about this uh, middle, this place, the middle circle here, which is where it penetrates, also has an area A. And I'll refer to the cylinder as a Gaussian surface. Given the simplicity of the electric field, that is, it is always perpendicular only to the flat end walls, I can write down the, the integral expression in Gauss's law on inspection. If I look again at it, the integral of the normal component of the electric field all around the cylinder, it's only non-zero at the end walls. So I'll write that uh, at, at each end wall, I have an um, electric field times a, and it happens twice. There are two end walls and going both directions. That is that integral, the Gauss's law integral. And that has to equal the enclosed charge inside of the cylinder. So let's figure out what is the enclosed charge. Well, I know that I have big Q coulombs per square meter, centimeter, uh, and I know that, that inside the cylinder, there's a is the, the, the number of square centimeters of charge that's in there. So I'm gonna argue I think correctly that the enclosed charge is big Q times A, the coulombs per square centimeter times square centimeter, divided by the permittivity. That, that is actually now the, the statement of Gauss's law. If you cancel the A's, just, just look at these two, two sides of this expression, you cancel the A's, you realize that the integral, that the electric field, due to an infinite wall of charge, is just Q over 2 times the permittivity. You get that just by canceling the A's. Okay, so if I have that now, I want to, to now make the situation a little more complex and say, okay, let's have two of these infinite walls of charge uh, parallel to each other, uh, one with a positive charge on it and one with a negative charge on it, and separated by a distance the separation we'll call T. 
So they're infinitely uh, in extent. So the widths are, are much, much larger than the, the separation. And one's got a positive charge and one has a negative charge per unit area on there. And I know that uh, you know between the plates, I want to find the electric field between the plates. I know that the electric field from the positive charge comes out like that, and the electric field from the negative charge goes into it. And I know that they're equal in magnitude, and they both point in the same direction. So between the plates, the electric field is actually pretty straightforward to write down. You just uh, have our expression we already came up with. And there's two of them. One positive plate, one negative plate. Cancel the twos and you're done. And that's the electric field between two parallel plates with equal and opposite charge. I can even ask, what's the electric field outside the, the space between the plates? And for that, I say, okay, the, the electric, the positive charge plate has a field that goes to the left. The negative charge plate has the equal and opposite field going to the right. And I realize that they cancel outside the plates. There's no electric field. But inside the place, we have an expression that we'll be able to, to rely on for the electric field. Parallel plates, so let's apply this now to capacity. When two conductors with equal and opposite charge are near each other, it's reasonable to talk about the capacitance between them. Capacitance is a coupling between charge and electric field. And so we have a charge now, just the total amount of charge, not of density, equals capacitance times potential differences, the definition of capacitance. And I put an absolute value sign on delta V because I just care about the magnitude of the voltage between the plates, not the direction. Now, so let me draw, draw these two parallel plates again. Remember, they're separated by, by this distance T. The electric field is related to that potential difference by the gradient of the potential difference. The electric field is minus the gradient of potential difference between the two plates. I can then you know, you know, you know, separate the fraction because you know derivatives are just fractions. And instead, write it as electric field times uh, dx is dv. And when you have some, a differential on both sides, you can put an integral sign in there. And you could say, well, that is delta V, is the integral of dV from one plate to the other. Electric field between the plates is a constant, so pull it out of the integral. And the integral of dx from one place to another is just distance and it's t. So now we know that the potential difference between those two plates is just electric field times T. I dropped a, a minus sign actually all the way through. Let, let's go ahead and put that ET into our expression up, up here for Q. And so I'll say, okay, the charge is, which is big Q, the charge density times area, is the capacitance times delta V, which we said is ET. And I'm going to replace E with the expression we came up with uh, previously. It's Q over the permittivity and times T. And now I look at this and I compare the second and the fourth terms. And I see I can cancel Q. So cancel Q between those two terms and solve for, for C, for capacitance, is epsilon. I'll, I'll write my uh, epsilon sub r, epsilon not times uh, area over separation t. And that's the expression for the capacitance, sorry about that epsilon being messy, uh, between two parallel plates. Now, I, that's total capacitance, and if these plates are infinite, well, that'd be an infinite amount of capacitance. So it's actually more reasonable to talk not about capacitance, you notice that's a small c. If I use a uppercase c, I'll put serifs on it. The uppercase c is the capacitance per unit area. So divide out area. And I have just uh, epsilon relative, epsilon naught over separation. That's the capacitance per unit area between two uh, equal and opposite charged plates. So I can take this expression and, and use a, it for an example. So if, for example, I have a, I have a silicon dioxide uh, layer, 10 microns thick. Okay, sandwiched between uh, two uh, conductive or semiconductive plates. Let me just draw you a picture. I've got my 
silicon dioxide and I've got my conductor and my conductor and that looks like a capacitor and so let me ask what is the capacitance per unit area of that that setup it's uh permittivity divided by the separation or in this case we'll call it the thickness because the di silicon dioxide is the medium in between and that's okay 3.9 write that down that's the relative dielectric constant of silicon dioxide and write this down too it's epsilon naught 8.5 times 10 to the minus 14 farads per centimeter. That's a perfectly valid set of units for epsilon naught divided by 10 microns, which is 10 to the minus third centimeter. And we find that, okay, the capacitance per unit area for that system is 3.5 times 10 to the minus 10 farads per square centimeter. And this is a very common, this is a very common uh, kind of calculation that you need to do when analyzing MOSFETs. And so we're doing it now.